while it would be impossible to completely review 50 years of research in tectonics in 20 minutes, we have largely focused on the role of TSG on the advancement of our science. To illustrate this, there have been 500 special publications of the Geological Society over the last 50 years. Over a third of these focus on some element of structural geology or tectonics. And the vast majority of them were, were linked to TSG meetings on specific themes such as thrust tectonics or continental deformation. And many of those that weren't linked to specific meetings were driven by members of the TSG community. And hopefully, as you'll see over the course of this presentation, many of these highlighted the current thinking at the time, but largely became the go-to publications on specific themes. Hello and welcome to a sort of review of tectonics over 50 years of, of TSG. And it's notable how the lifespan of TSG as a group coincides pretty neatly with the uh, advent and development of uh, plate tectonic theory, which sort of governs so much of the behaviour on our planet. So we thought we'd begin this section with a visualisation of how it looked some 50 years ago when plate tectonic ideas were first developed versus how it's going at the present time with more recent understanding of the Earth's dynamics reaching from the surface plates deep down into the, the, the depths of the mantle. But of course, plate tectonics didn't spring out of nothing at the end of the 60s and the beginning of the 70s. It built on a lot of work over previous decades, notably mapping of the bathymetry and structure of the ocean basins through the 50s and 60s that provided a huge volume of data that enabled plate tectonic ideas to take hold. And even this work drew on much earlier studies that thought about the fit of the continents and how continental drift seemed to explain the, the reconstructions of past belts of climatic and depositional features, drawing on the work of people like Wegener going all the way back to the early part of the 20th century. And by the mid 1960s, advent and development of computer technology and techniques such as paleomagnetism had enabled people to be far more confident about the reality of continental drift as a process. What was needed was an explanation of a viable mechanism, and that's what the plate tectonic theory provides. As well as helping us to understand the structure of the ocean basins, it quickly became apparent that plate tectonics was a neat explanation for the deformation and behaviour of the continents, as shown here in the remarkable paper by Julian Bird from the dawn of the 1970s, where they put mountain building in a plate tectonic context for pretty much the first time. And it was notable through TSG in the 1970s how people picked up and ran with these new plate tectonic ideas and used them to develop a deeper understanding of Earth's history back through time, not least through the geology of the British Isles, as evidenced here by these diagrams from the 1970s showing uh, ideas around the development and destruction of the Apatus Ocean preserved as relics in the basement rocks around Britain and Ireland and beyond. So by the end of the 1970s, TSG had very much taken light and was leading the way in understanding how structural geology and tectonic theories could be used to understand the development of the, the structure of our planet. And welcome to Tectonics of the 80s. Um, at this stage, plate tectonics is largely accepted. Uh, however, it created problems for structural geologists and those focused on continental tectonics, as it didn't simply explain the structures or the evolution of the upper lithosphere. In, in fact, as John Dewey put it, plate tectonics does not make geology any easier. It actually made it a lot more complicated in that geologists were constrained to build and test models that conform to a rational plate tectonic framework. The significant re-evaluation of continental deformation continued throughout the 80s, with advances largely coinciding with TSG meetings and the resulting JAWSOC special publications, which focused on various tectonic styles from extension and inversion to strike slip. But one of the standout themes, maybe me showing my biases here, was that of thrust tectonics. Um, 
and particularly trying to link the intense deformation we observe in mountain belts with plate tectonics and deeper crustal structures. And despite you know, some continued support through, through fixist ideas and, and gravity sliding as a, as a mechanism for orogenesis on a crustal scale, really by the end of the 80s, there appeared to be widespread acceptance of plate tectonics in its relationship with orogenesis. This was largely driven by continued fieldwork, but also the integration of geophysical techniques with, with field observations. And as Kenneth Hsu concluded in 1989, um, in terms of alpine orogenesis, there can be no fundamental conflict between the geology of the Alps and plate tectonic theory. The apparent paradox has been man-made by those who have conditioned themselves too deeply to defunct theories. One of the other big themes of the 80s was was advances in geophysical methods, but also modeling techniques, both mathematical and analog, to solve geological problems from a range of settings, you know, whether it be extensional or, or inversion, as we've seen in some of these gorgeous examples. There was a real step change in data collection and management, data collected to solve specific problems rather than to fill in the blanks in geological mapping. It, it really seemed to me that the geology in general made a wholesale transition from qualitative data cataloging to quantitative physical science. There was a real explosion in, in the capability of computing power throughout the 90s, uh, as well as improvements in data science. And it's perhaps not a coincidence that this, this coincided with the start of the modern era of structural geology, obviously very much based on the groundwork carried out in the previous decades, uh, but also maybe due to more regular integration of geological and geophysical studies. Our understanding of deformation in 3D became more complete throughout the 90s, and this, this may be accounted for by advances in modelling, but also the prevalence and availability of 3D seismic data to the academic community. These certainly would have helped drive our understanding of fault zones and their kinematics across a range of settings. Um, and similar to the 80s, TSG meetings and resulting special publications had a considerable role in these advances. The other thing that was big in the 90s was, was the idea of supercontinent cycles and, and trying to establish links between mantle dynamics and plate tectonics, similar to, to in the 60s and 70s, whereby plate tectonics was seen as the mechanism for continental drift. We needed a mechanism for plate tectonics. Um, and that really seemed to sit with, with ideas of mantle dynamics and how supercontinental cycles may affect that or be driven by that. Um, and this was largely advanced by the work of Murphy, Nance, Moore, Hoffman, Condy and others. So we get to the 2000s and if the 60s and 70s had been the decades of discovery and then the 80s and 90s, we saw this explosion of data collection campaigns uh, that went alongside the revolution in our thinking and in our understanding of tectonics. The 2000s are very much a time when we see a real drive towards data integration. Long gone are the simplistic plate models that use rigid plates and portray deformation as something that just happens in plate boundaries with the continental interiors going undeformed. We now have all these models, simulations, animations at, at a variety of scales that show tectonic processes in much more detail than ever before. And that's understandable because not only we have a lot of data collected over decades before, but computer power has also increased dramatically in the lead up to the 2000s and then through the 2000s. In addition to that, there is very much a, a feel that if we had enough data, whatever enough data might be uh, for a model, then we should be able to explain all of it in this one single model, take the opening of the Atlantic. Um, in those early reconstructions, there were all these gaps and overlaps between the continental margins because the model was quite simplistic and because it didn't take into account perhaps margin scale or, or basin scale data. And if we do that, we'll be able to improve this model. We now, of course, know that just the amount of data alone is not enough. More data is not necessarily better. Other things come into play. When we talk about data integration in the 2000s, that is not limited to taking all the information that was collected in the 70s, 80s, 90s and, and bringing it together and, and um, increasing the inputs to our models. 
but it's also about connecting across scale and to an extent connecting these different types of models that we now have, some of which are maybe things like numerical models. Um, the, this example here is uh, of rifting. Well, how do we connect those models of rifting with a plate scale model? How do we depict these smaller scale um, processes in larger scale models and vice versa as well? And so through the 2000s, we saw kind of the, the the birth and growth of deformable plate models. Um, and this is great because it, for example, again, continuing with the example of a divergent setting, it allows us to have a plate model that better depicts things like continental breakup from the start of it through to seafloor spreading and, and, and beyond and to the formation of an ocean. But it can also have drawbacks. And that's because oftentimes numerical models might be set up using assumptions that are made on the basis of observations made from plate models. So then we're kind of going, or we are uh, susceptible of going round and round in circles and have this, uh, these circularity um, issues. The need to also connect surface tectonics at all scales with mantle dynamics, which had already become apparent in the 90s, takes big step steps forward in the 2000s, thanks to things like the advancement of disciplines such as mantle tomography. Um, we're moving well away from sea and plate tectonics and mantle dynamics as a chicken and egg type question where we're asking, you know, what started first and what drives what. Um, but we, we now understand that they are very closely intertwined and that very much like numerical models of rifting have helped us improve how our plate scale models depict continental breakup, there's a lot of useful information in the mantle to better understand regions where subduction has taken place and to fill in that gap in plate models where before we had very little to go on to reconstruct those areas because we have no plate on the surface to make observations, to make interpretations from. If you cast your mind back to the 50s and the 60s, we've, we've come a very, very long way. Um, and so have our models and the way we model tectonic processes. But it's quite, a, quite interesting if you think that back in the 60s, when, for example, for the Atlantic, we had a single model, the first computer assisted model. It was one solution that satisfied the available data. It wasn't great. It wasn't perfect. Um, it had gaps and overlaps along the continental margins, but we had that one solution and it satisfied the data. If you look at the models of the Atlantic published over the last couple of decades, you probably find at least 15 or 20 of them. And they all satisfy their input data. They're all based on a lot more data than before. The modeling techniques are more sophisticated. We have more computer power. We still have clever people, I think. Um, they're all different. And in being all different, they're illustrating how much we still don't know. And a lot of these unknowns, or as I wrote, they are known unknowns, things that we've known for a long time, we just don't fully understand, relate to the way in which plate interiors behave. How do they move? How do they deform? How and when does deformation propagate from the plate boundaries into the plate interiors? And they're all things that we've been working harder to understand through the 2000s and I think particularly over the last decade. I'm not going to try to predict what's going to be the next big breakthrough in tectonic research uh, in the next 50 years, but to me one thing is clear and that's that if we want to keep moving forward we need to keep doing some of these things we're doing, um, working across scales and connecting across scales and also working towards understanding the why and these things that we didn't know 50 years ago and we still only partly understand today and for me the, the biggest one of those is plate driving forces and the mechanisms driving plate tectonics at global scale. So because so much of our research in tectonics relies on computer models and simulations you have to ask yourself as well what is the recipe for a good model? What makes a good model? And, you know, in the early 2000s, the drive was very much to have more data because we were very aware that our models were not that great because there were gaps. There were gaps in our knowledge and our understanding. Um, but perhaps in coming up with a recipe for a good model, 
it's not so important how many ingredients we have, but how we're choosing them, what we're choosing, how we're cooking them, and also very importantly, what we're leaving in the fridge for a different day.